Hey, this is Gilby Clark, and you are listening to Appetite for Distortion with Brando. This is Appetite for Distortion. And welcome to the podcast, Appetite for Distortion, episode 176. My name is Brando, and thank you as always to Mike Squires from Duff McKagan's Loaded for our theme song. Uh, Mike is going to be back on the show at some point. Uh, busy guy, he has his Couch Riffs podcast, so be sure to check that out as well. Um, in addition to looking forward to Squires, I, I, I think maybe since the beginning, Gilby, Gilby Clark, You've been on my wish list. I know you're, you're super busy. I'm, you're always riding across the country in a motorcycle, and I know that's not always convenient to have an interview on. But to finally get to have you on uh, on the podcast, get to speak with somebody I've admired for quite some time, I just really appreciate it, and um, and, and just welcome and thank you. Uh, you're welcome, Brando. Uh, happy to be here. And I didn't realize that Squires did the intro. That's pretty badass. Yeah, it's been very cool, Gilby, getting to do this Gene R themed podcast. It's just because everyone does a rock podcast or a talk podcast, so I try to make it a little different. Uh, I mean, just for example, the episode I put out before you, I had Brian Posehn on the comedian because uh, he's talking about his new comedy metal record and he wanted to talk about music and rock and roll and Gene R, of course. And uh, and then I had a country artist from Canada, uh, Corey Marks, who covers in a country way Paradise City. So I kind of do it a little bit <laughs> different. You know, uh, yeah. At this point, it's really touched, you know, so many people in so many countries everywhere. But also, the family that started with the original five guys has kind of grown. You know, for whether it's you know Duff's band or Slash's band or my band or Dizzy's band, you know, it's that family's gotten huge now. You're absolutely right, and that's kind of what I'm doing. So there are uh, a few members of that family that were excited that you were coming on today. We'll get to listener questions later, but these are names that I'm sure will be familiar to you. Uh, Gary Sunshine, uh, he says... Oh, right on, yes. Yeah, who played on Oh My God. He's in, of course, uh, Circus of Power. He says, uh, cool, yes. hi to Gilby. <laughs> so very very brief. Uh, and Mark Dan Zeisen. Uh, your you know, your former bandmate, the uh, drummer, he's always commenting on my my posts and stuff. So Mark is a has become a listener. He was a guest, and now he's just become. Uh, a... That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, it's funny because I knew Gary from the, like I said the Circus of Power days. My band before Kill for Thrills used to play with Circus of Power all the time. So you know that was a, a good times. Right on. And then the last one, and maybe we can start off here. Uh, I was so happy. Because I didn't know of him at first, and he found me on on Instagram, and that's Jimmy Harold from Hillbilly uh, Harold. Uh, ah, ah, Jimmy, now that's a character there. <laughs> I, I mean, because I didn't know about him, and when I got to you know quote unquote meet him, I, I guess fell in love with not just him as a person, but uh, his music because it it just rocks. I mean, who has a a, a PBR mic stand? And you produced <laughs> the record, right? Didn't you? The, the yes, first... I did. So if you, if you could talk about that, because they signed to Golden Robot Records, which is what your album is, is on as well. Uh, tell us about how that came to be. Well, once again, Jimmy is great. You know, I mean, besides he's a, a, a wonderful music fan, and that stretches everywhere, not just hard rock, but like, you know, like the outlaw country thing and everything. And, uh, you know, Jimmy's just very a passionate person, and uh, I met him at the at the restaurant that he works at, which I think is where Slash met him too. And I went to see his band, and his band kicked ass, man. They were really, really good. They just, you know, just threw it down your throat, man. It's just loud and proud rock and roll. So when they they actually got a record deal from another label and wanted to make a record, and Jimmy uh, approached me, and I said, yeah, let's do it. And we spent a good year, I'd say, in, like, pre-production. You know, he was doing a lot of co-songwriting, and so I would help him with arrangements. And then when we finally got the band together, um, you know, we, we put a lot of time into making that record and making it good and not just 
having it sound like, you know, just another rock and roll record. Like I wanted to get in deep and make it a classic record. Mm. Um, un- unfortunately, what happened was once the record was done or actually in the middle of the deal, they were, uh, they were signed to a label who got bought out by Sony and through the process of Sony acquiring the label, they actually kept Hillbilly Herald on the label. And when the record was finished, they accepted the record. Sony did. They loved it. Everything was going to happen. And then one day it just didn't. So uh, they got their record back. And I had been doing some work with Golden Robot. So I suggested it. And Mark, the head of Golden Robot, liked what he heard. And now we're label mates. That's, that's so cool. And you, you briefly touched on the story about how you met Jimmy. And it was when he was working at the restaurant, and I loved the fact that he, I think you said he was 35 at the time, and Gilby, I'm, I'm 36, so Slash comes into his life and basically tells him, if, if you have this dream of being a rock star, you know, basically tells him to change his life, for the good, of course, Yeah. you know, and I'm thinking about that, what if Slash said that to me now at my age? So is that something that... Does that surprise you that Slash has like changed the course of direction of someone's life, like Jimmy Harold? <laughs> well, I think for someone like Jimmy, and once again, I'm not speaking for Jimmy. But I understand. Just, I think I, sometimes somebody, sometimes some people just, you know, they're undecided. You know, they're in the middle. Of, wow, I don't know if I want to do this. I'm, I'm doing okay with where I'm at right now, and you know, it's definitely taking a, a, a shot, and it's a risk. So when somebody of the stature of Slash says, "Dude, do it." That's all you needed. <laughs> you <laughs> totally. know? I mean, I could see if you you didn't have the thought in your head, but you know, he was on the fence. You know, he he was committed to his band, but as we all know, it's hard. You know, it's really, really hard. And like I said, Slash just made that mention, and there you go, rock and roll. Well, I, I love it. And, and someone else that you probably know, uh, Ron Young from Little Caesar. Oh. Yeah, Ron is great, man. And these are all people that I've known for a long time, Mark Demzeisen and Ron Young and Gary. I mean, I haven't seen Gary in a long time, but uh, I just we just did a show uh, with Little Caesar, and Ron came up and sang Won't Get Fooled Again with us and just destroyed it. He was amazing. Right. So he was on a few episodes ago, and he was great. And my audience loved it, you know, not just the... Uh, like the Terminator stuff and, and, and finding out yeah. more about his audition for Slash's Snake Pit. So I'm wondering if we can talk about that for just a, you know, a little bit because it was recently like an anniversary of uh, It's 5 O'Clock Somewhere and it's such an under both of those records, but I know you're, uh, you were involved in the first one. Um, what was the audition process like? Because he, he told us that Slash really liked him but wanted somebody that sounded like, like Axel. So were you involved? In- I don't think, you know what, I don't think that was the case at all. Okay. No, I, I think, uh, as a matter of fact, Ron was my choice. You mm. know, like, I loved Ron. I, he was definitely my choice. Okay. Um, and I know I, I know Matt has kind of come public to saying, you know, Dover wasn't his choice and he wasn't consulted on it. I, I think Matt was kind of busy during that time because, I mean, I worked a, a little bit uh, with Ron when it was happening, but... You know, I was on tour at the time. You know, Matt was still in GNR world. So Slash was kind of doing the brunt of, of the work. But I liked Ron. I think what it was was when he just heard Dover, it wasn't a matter of sound like Axel. I think he's, he just thought he was more versatile. Okay. You know, where Ron, Ron is Ron. Ron Ron's got this bluesy, you know, uh, sound to his voice. And, it, you know, it would have taken it in a different direction. But, uh, like, I'm not speaking for Slash, but I do remember the conversations. And um, when he told me about Dover, I go, no, I get it. I get it. You're right. He is more versatile. But, uh, yeah, Ron was definitely my choice at the time. Right on. I mean, it's just one of those fun games of of what if, and you just play it in your head. But Yeah, what if. I know those are funny, aren't they? Sure. <laughs> you never know. So this... Um... This will tie in, and I'll, and I'll sprinkle in uh, the fan questions as they come up organically. So this is from uh, from Anderson from San Antonio. Uh, he said, I would love to know if you ever met Paul Tobias and if the 94-95 version of Snake Pit ever considered getting back together after their tour concluded. Um, no, I never met Paul. Um, you know, that stuff all happened when I was kind of far apart from it, you know. Fair. I mean— to, to put some clarity into it, you know, I, I had done my solo record and I was on tour for a year and then literally went from one week finishing my solo tour to the next date of the slash tour, you know? So 
even though, you know, obviously GNR, you know, was my priority, you know, it was very, if there wasn't any clarity to it at that time. So yeah, I had nothing to do uh, with any of that. As far as uh, Snake Pit moving on, nah, I mean, I think, you know, once you know, things move on, you know, for me as a musician, once things move on, I, I don't like going back. You okay. know, I kind of feel like you did it. It felt good. You know, I, is it going to be better? And most of the time it's going to be worse. <laughs> so, yeah, I, no, I never, like, look back. You know, once we did it, I was happy. I had a great time doing Snake Pit. It was, you know, like I said, Sasha and I were just kind of continuing on what we were doing with GNR at that time. But, yeah, I think all of us kind of wanted to move on to do different things at that point. Right on. And we can, you know, I'm not going to keep you here forever. Uh, we can go deep dive into Snake Pit because obviously I'm, I'm that kind of nerd if I'm doing a podcast about this. But I, I want to talk about looking <laughs> <laughs> looking forward. And I'm glad that you released the single, Rock and Roll is Getting Louder, because we were, I don't want to use the word tease, but we're really anticipating your new record, which we thought we were going to get the end of last year, right? So are we going to, we're getting Absolutely. the, so we're getting the gospel truth this year. That's, that's the, that's the truth. There. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it was that is there. Definitely the truth. Yeah. Oh, okay. You know these things are. It's hard for me because you know. I, I mean, I. To be honest, the last couple of years I've been trying not to do interviews because you know I'd, I'd rather do it when the record's ready. That makes the sense. The record's been done mm. for a long time. You know, it's it's been done. You know, the label is a fairly new label, so they're developing. And you know, when the time is right, the time is right. It's like you don't want to get it out just for sake of getting it out, and then nothing happens. You know, okay. so so that's all it is. You know, it's just choosing the right time. Matter of fact, we were ready to go. I think towards the end of summer with with the single, the first single. But then we brought a new publicist on board, but they weren't coming on board till January. And you know, it, it's little things like that that sure. kind of hard to talk about that you know publicly. But it's just when it's the record's done. You know, I'm extremely happy with it. And it is coming out soon. This is the first single. We'll probably do a couple singles before the actual record will come out. Okay. And I want to credit this listener for the specific question. Uh, Stephen Heyman yeah. said, so, I mean, it's great that it's going to come out regardless, but so we don't have a, a, a date necessarily yet. No, 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 exactly. But it is soon. It is, is definitely, yeah, we don't have a release date yet, but that is coming very, very soon. Like I said, it's done. It's ready. I, and you got to understand, I hate talking about the anticipation because I don't want to be one of those guys that, you know, a record taking 10 years to come out. But it has, 03 was the last time I did a record. Right. But I really didn't start this record till a couple of years ago. It's not like a, it's a 10-year record. The record was made over a course of a year. You know, just when people were available. Okay, because you know what? I was going to ask you that because this is your first solo record in, in like 15 years, right? So if it hasn't yeah. been a 15-year process and it's only a couple years, no. what what was the spark? Because you're, you're still out touring, doing shows, you know, you're going to NAM. Like, what was the spark that said, I, I, I have something to say. I want to put out a new record. What was the spark for you? Well, it's actually interesting. Um, well, so... In oh, uh, what's really odd is uh, I believe my last record came out in '03. I could be wrong. I'm pretty bad about dates. <laughs> uh, I actually did two records that year. I did the Colonel Parker record with Slim Jim Phantom and, and Teddy Zigzag, and then uh, I did my solo record. I was making two records at the same time. That I actually was producing both and kind of singing on both records and writing everything. So that time it was very busy. And like I said, you know, you, you do live dates, you know, things get offered, you get an anchor date, then you add a couple more to it, and projects come up. You know, my solo career was never a priority. It was just uh, something to do. You know, it was like even in the, you know, when I did it in 94, you know, GNR wasn't doing anything. We knew we were taking a break for a while, so I was like, oh, let me make a record. You know, and then Slash's record came up, and things just kind of happened. I didn't you know, write it on a piece of paper. I want to be a solo artist. It okay. just happened. Okay. Some things went well, some things didn't go well, you know, but, uh, so I wasn't trying, but I was at, uh, it's interesting. I was at Motley Crue's very last show at the, uh, Staples center that they were doing. And, uh, I saw Motley Crue's very first show. So I thought it was kind of romantic if I saw their last show. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I'm sitting in, I was sitting in Nikki's uh, dressing room area. You know, uh, it actually, it was funny. Is there wasn't like a million people. It was just a few people. I knew most of the guys and women that were there. And uh, David Darling was there, and we were talking about records and stuff. And he, and he said to me, you, know, you haven't made a record in a long time. And I go, yeah. I go, you know, 
yeah, the climate, you know, what's the point of making a record? Do I really need a new record to go do some live dates, you know, and, you know, in Chile? Huh. <laughs> and, uh, and he goes, no, you're an artist. You need to make music. It's very important. He went on this whole thing, and I go, yeah, but, you know, it's not going to get on the radio now. It just mm. seems like, uh, you know, like I really, when I, as I'm talking, I sounded like I was defeated, and, and I'm not that person. And, and I was talking to him, and I was going, no, you know what? You're right. You know, I kind of forgot about the creative element because I have been creative during this time. Like I said, I work with a lot of other people, and I get, give my creativity to that, but I don't give it to myself. Mm. And so it really got my juices going, like, all right, well, let me see what I got. And, you know, started collecting riffs and ideas, and, and it really just started then. And, you know, started finding guys to play on it. Usually I start with the drummer. Like, if I have the... I, I pretty much write the whole thing. It's ready to go. And I find a drummer that I think fits that song and we pound it out. And then, you know, I add a bass player onto it and, you know, and it just kind of, I, I let it develop organically. But that process, like I said, it did take about a year because some guys were available, some weren't, other things going on. You have to do shows, things like that. A couple of interesting things that you, you said. First, like a light one more, just like, I guess, a deep question. Um, and I like that the, how you it's the romantic thing to do to see motley crew their first show on their last show uh are you i mean you got to be happy though that they're back or does it ruin like your your undertaker streak like does it ruin like the romance does it ruin something for you no okay. i mean it, it, i'm like i said it was just it was just a, like a a funny idea at the time you know it's like oh it's first show it's their last show you know I mean, nobody's holding anybody accountable. Like, you know, you said you weren't going to anymore, <laughs> and you are. I mean, it's, right. It's rock and roll. One thing we've learned is there are no rules. <laughs> Very true. Uh, but there may be no rules, but there is motivation. So you were talking about how yep. your solo stuff has, has never been your motivation, which I find surprising. What has been your motivation? Yep. What's, 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 since you were a little kid, since you were a little Gilby, to pick up a guitar, what's been the goal for you? Well, I mean, it, it's interesting. When I first started, I always wanted to be the guitar player. You know, I, I always wanted, and even, you know, up until Guns N' Roses, I was always the guitar player in the band. You know, I never had another guitar player. You know, I never played with another guitar player. I mean, I always, you know, saw myself as, you know, the Keith to Mick, you know, the, the Ron Wood to Rod Stewart. Mm. That's what I always, you know, saw myself as when when I was a kid. And then, you know, as life happens and challenges come aboard and everything stuff, you know, it really, my motivation was just to be better, you know, and I don't measure myself like, am, am I as good as Joe Satriani or Steve Vai? I don't, I just go, am, am I the best that I can be? You know, I mean, I, I don't not touch my guitar, you know, for, uh, you know, two weeks or whatever, you know, I play it pretty much every day still. And, and that's my motivation. Um, I think what will come to surprise people is the singing thing I don't even think about. <laughs> it's, I always said, if I'm making a solo record, I should be singing it. Am I the best qualified person for it? Absolutely not. But you know what? Tough. That's just the way it is. <laughs> I'm going to sing it. If it's good, it's good. If it's bad, it's bad. You know, that, that that's not my problem. So, because it's been great doing this GNR podcast because we talk about anniversaries and stuff. And uh, when the anniversary came up of uh, Pawn Shop Guitars last year, and I think even recently, Mark Dan Zeisen posted a like a live uh, concert you guys did here, maybe at the Bowery Ballroom somewhere in New York City. So it, the the conversation comes up, and when we we think back at that record, it's just as if, and I say we as fans, we hold hold it in such high regard. You know, when we talk about the the solo records that these this family tree is uh, has made. So it, when you talk about combining that with like that whole being solo was never a priority to you. Where do you hold, where do you hold that as far as like maybe your proudest achievements in your, in your career? Cause I'm curious, what do you, what, what your thought process is now, what you prioritize, what, what has have been, if not the solo record, the first one, or maybe it's this next one, what are mm -hmm. the proudest moments that you've, you've had? What do you consider? Well, I mean, Pawn Shop Guitars for me uh, is still like my favorite record. And it just, you know, when you make a record, so many things have to go right. You know, it's not just about the songwriting. It's not just about the performance. You know, it, it, there's the business side of it. You know, we all have some of our favorite records in our past. And we go, God, it wasn't an amazing record that nobody ever heard. 
I mean, we all talk about the New York Dolls, but I don't think that record even sold 100,000 copies. I mean, right. everybody we knew bought that record, it would have sold 10 million copies. So for me, Pawn Shop was a success in the sense that it was the exact record I wanted to make at that time. And it worked. Like, every, like those songs were songs I had been writing for a few years before GNR, while I was in GNR. It was just kind of like the perfect situation. There was no pressure. There was just, it was very organic. And then obviously when the Guns N' Roses thing came along, it gave me the opportunity to really get some amazing players on it that didn't say no. You know, obviously the GNR guys, you know, getting, you know, Slash, Duff, Axel, you know, Dizzy, you know, getting them to be a part of it really contributed to that record being in what I consider a good record. And, you know, the business part, I mean, it, it did okay. You know, considering, we got to remember what we're talking about here. These are solo records, you know. I mean, it seems like when everybody says, you know, I'm doing a solo record, there's a little chuckle at the end of mm. it. <laughs> Interesting. Because they are, you know. Even now, you know, like when I, back, you know, when you make a record and like you go to, you know, like, you know, you sell it to a label or talk to labels and stuff, you know, I've never, ever had a label, you know, really say no to me. I don't like the record. You know, it's usually, uh, Gilby's a solo record. I don't know if we can really do, you know, do it justice. You know, it's just, it's hard. It's a hard sell. You know, we're all, you know, we're not Slash. We're not, you know, uh, Zach Wild. You know, these are, you know, guys that, you know, deserve, you know, to make solo records and the attention that comes with it. So it's hard, and I know that going going into you know making these records, and that's not saying that's why it's not a priority. I just never really made it a priority. I always thought it was a you know plus one really my solo career. It's like I'm a guitar player, I'm a musician. Yeah, I make my own records. You want to listen to them, check them out. If not, I you know I get it. <laughs> that's, that's interesting. I guess you really don't set yourself up to be disappointed that way, and you're. Again, they never say no to you, so it's all positive things, but I guess you're not well, expecting yeah, the world. I, I don't, like I said, I, that, that, I, don't, I don't see it that way. I, I'm satisfied when it's done. I always say when it's done is when I'm happy. You know, when, it, when it's finished, I'm happy. I will never turn on a record I don't like. I mean, granted, I've made records where I go, ah, oh, they weren't that good, but it just, you know, when I turned it in, I was happy with it. It was the best I could do at that time. So I always feel like that's my job is to write, record, and perform. The success part, that, that's that's not my gig, you know. I'm, it's not for me to sell the records, you know. It That's, you know, somebody else's job. I've always been good about, you know, look, I'll do what I do well, but you do what you do well. And I'm not going to question. Don't tell me how to play guitar, and I won't tell you, you know, how to sell a record. Oh, that's what I was talking to, to Ron Young about, and I've, other guests as well, about how you define success. And... So, so I guess how would you define success? Because I would say you're you're very successful. To me, you have, I guess this is my perspective and a lot of fans' perspective that you your name still has a cachet of a of a Zach Wild. So again, your perspective is interesting and it, it comes off as very humble. So actually, I'll sprinkle in this uh, fan comment. This is from Garrett Smith. It says uh, Gilby seems really down to earth. Uh, enjoyed his Houston show. So you seem very down to earth. I, I, I don't think you really. Uh, I guess realize the power that you, that you may have. Well, I mean, thank you. I, I I don't like I said those those are the things that I don't think about. To be honest, you know, I I don't I I conduct myself as when I go through life, I conduct myself as a human being first. I don't I don't you know walk around. I'm a rock star. You know, it's like I I don't when I meet people, I don't think do they know who I am or my name. I, that doesn't even come into my realm. You know, it's just like you know, hey, if if you're walking out the door, you know, and, and behind me or whatever, I open the door for people, you know, it's just, it's, I, you know, I don't know what that is. We're, we're, we're all different, you know? Sure. And I, 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 you know, it's, I don't know, it's kind of hard to explain. Like I, said, I just don't think about it. I think that's, that's great. And I think that's why this fan base, you know, is, is there for you, for you to, you weren't away for 15 years, you were out and about, but to not have new material i mean this fan base is is with you is excited i think it's because you are are that way in that album uh your, your music speaks th the same way that you do so let's talk more about the the new album because we were you were mentioning some of the you know the big names you've you've worked with before on your solo stuff so who who else is on the record the gospel truth 
Well, on, on this track that's out right now is uh, Kenny Aronoff plays drums. Uh, Kenny's played on a lot of records in his day, but he is definitely one of the best drummers alive. Uh, and my old buddy, uh, Muddy Stardust, or Muddy Dutton, played bass on the track. Uh, Muddy was in Colonel Parker with me. He used to do a lot of the Thursday night jam nights with us at the Cat Club back in the day. And uh, I played all the guitars and I sang. Um, I had uh, Chad Stewart, who plays drums in Faster Pussycat, also played in my band sometimes, did the background vocals, along with Matt Starr, who plays drums in uh, with Mr. Big and Ace Freely. He sang backgrounds on that track. On the rest of the record I did, I had Matt Starr, I had Chad, I had my drummer, Troy Patrick Farrell, I had Stephen Perkins from Jane's Addiction, did quite a few tracks and did a great job. Cool. Um, I had, uh, on bass, I had, uh, my bass player, EJ curse. I had muddy. I had Sean McNabb who played in Dokken and is out there doing this cream project right now. Uh, and, and I, Nikki six <laughs> play bass on the track and Nikki killed it, man. He did such a great job. Oh, right on. Um, is that going to be one of the, yeah, you don't want, you don't have to say if it's a secret, is that going to be one of the singles? Uh, the Nikki I six? hope so. Okay. I hope so. The, the track is called tight one. I hope so. I, like, tight I, I don't, I, like that. I, I mean, I guess, yeah, I guess I do have a little control over it, but, uh, the, the main track is called the gospel truth. And, um, that's going to be the second single. Okay. Um, it's, it's definitely different. I mean, like if you hear this song, rock and roll is getting louder, it really kind of sounds like it could be on pawn shop or it can be on the hangover. It's really kind of what I do. You know, um, the song, the gospel truth is a little bit different, you know, I mean, it, it's definitely me, but it's, uh, it's, it is a little more modernized, you know, it, it, uh, it's got an interesting flair to it. It's got real horns on it, and it was by uh, Cleto, who plays on the Jimmy Kimmel show, is the band leader, actually cut the horns while he was on the TV show. He, during the breaks, they have a Pro Tools studio, and they, he cuts horns for me and sends them back to me. Huh. <laughs> wow. Technology, right? <laughs> yeah, it's amazing what we can do. Yeah. Most of the record was recorded at my studio, which my studio is actually in my house. I know a lot of musicians say they have a home studio, but I actually have a real studio. Like it's 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 nice. It's got a neat board and it's you know got all the good stuff that you know A and M and all the the, the good studios have. A um, couple things, like I said, we did farm out like the um, uh, the horns were did elsewhere. I think Muddy actually did his track at his house, but everything else was done at my place. Oh, very cool. So, where did the uh, the title track and I guess the title of the album where did that come from? Well, um, it's uh, where it came from is is when I write a record. I mean, sometimes it's it's my perspective, and sometimes it's not always the truth. You know, sometimes it's my um, observing things. You know, and I, it, it's my take on what's going on. Which, you know, it's my truth, but it might not be the truth. You know, and mm. when I was making this record, I really uh, I wanted to be better in every way. I wanted the guitar playing to be better. I wanted the singing to be better. And I wanted the lyrics to be better. So I spent a lot of time and a lot of hard work, you know, working on those kind of things, like simple things like lyrics, like uh, it, you very rarely, and, and I'm talking, you know, I don't know how many solo records I have out there, but you never <laughs> find me say, I love you or come back to me, baby. You know, a lot of this generic stuff. I don't do that stuff. You know, I always try to find a different way of almost saying the same thing, you know, like I, I work hard at that, you know, it's, uh, I, I want, I know there are a lot, there has been some, you know, like reviews out there and people talking about, you know, like I've even Slash said it, people ask him, what's monkey chow about? And Slash goes, I have no idea. You have to ask Gildy. <laughs> <laughs> and I like, I like that. I like that. I, you know, on the first record pawn shop guitars, I didn't put the lyrics on the record. And I do that on purpose because I think I want people to have their own interpretation of it. I want them to listen to it. And, you know, if they're wrong, they're wrong. It's all right. You know, it's, it's okay. But, you know, just think differently. Don't, don't just go in and know everything. We don't have to tell everybody everything. So gospel truth is me just kind of getting back to the truth. Look, this is it. This is real. It's my truth. But this is real, and this is it right now. And that's what the gospel truth is all about. Right on. I love it. I love that so much. And s since you brought up Monkey Chow, uh, another fan comment. This is from Mackin26 uh, from Ireland uh, via Twitter. Uh, give him props for Monkey Chow. What a tune. I learned my craft to that song and album because he's a guitar player. 
the wow. the uh, monkey chow fans out there. <laughs> you know what's funny about monkey chow is that song came after pawn shop was done. It's you know when we were. I mean, basically, and and it, this is old news. You know, the Snake Pit record was us writing songs for G and R. You right. know, it was Slash writing songs for G and R. It was me writing songs for G and R. And so everything that I contributed to that record, I was hoping was going to be a Guns N' Roses song. And, you know, the way GNR wrote songs was, you know, it's kind of like everybody, you know, contri- contributed ingredients in the soup. You know, there was a basic start, you know, usually it was Izzy or Duff, and then the guys would embellish it. But I've always been a guy that when I write a song, I write a, I write a song. You know, it's like, you know, here, here's, here's the drum part, here's the guitar part, here's the lyrics, here's the, you know, it, they're kind of done. And so when I contributed, uh, you know, like I said, it's also old news that all the pawn shop songs were given to the guns guys, you know, as before I made the record, Hey, is this anything you'd consider for the next guns record? And, and they passed, they said, Nope, we're going to start fresh. So when we did start fresh, like I said, pawn shop was done. Monkey child was one of those first songs that I gave to them, you know, and slash liked it, you know, like he liked it. He loved the riff and everything and stuff. But, you know, I, I got the word, you know, from Axel that he didn't like it. Okay, fair. So that fair. was me trying to contribute, you know, to GNR. I got gotcha. you. All the other stuff on Pawn Shop, even though I contributed it to the band, I didn't write it for the band. You know, like I just wrote, I just wrote the songs and said, "Hey, these are my current songs." But Monkey Chow, I actually wrote to be a Guns N' Roses tune, and same with like I believe uh, "Good to Be Alive," and it was one of mine, and there was another one, uh, "Dime Store Rock." Okay, uh, was one was one of mine. I always find that interesting when a, a song is written in a certain time period and it can go perhaps between artists and it's just, you know, it's it's kind of, I don't know, watching like a child grow or maybe you don't even know about that child until it comes out and you have to read about the history of where, how the origin of this song. So uh, with that, that thought being said, this is uh, another question. This is from uh, Ken from Long Island. Uh, he writes, supposedly... This I Love, off Chinese Democracy, was something Axel was working on in 1994. wonder if Gilby was familiar with it or any other songs that would end up on, on Chinese. No, I, you know what? I, it, it, maybe it's possible, but I don't remember. Okay. I mean, I, I've only heard Chinese Democracy one time, so I, it, I'm not, not a good a, uh, person to Do you mind, <laughs> tell you what, what was there and what wasn't there. I got you. Do you mind if I ask your opinion of it? Yeah, it's really simple. It's just, look, I mean, we all listen to records and we go, hey, I like that record. I don't like that record. It's just when I heard it, I go, oh, yeah, it's good. I, it's not something that would be in my rotation. I mean, I, you know, I still play, you know, uh, you shook me all night long every day. <laughs> it's, just, it's just not my thing. That's all plain and simple. Right on, right on. Uh, this is a, a, fu- a fun, I guess, story. Maybe you can um, elaborate on it. This is from my... My buddy, uh, former, he used to work in Nikki Six's show, and he's he's like, uh, it's so funny. He he works for iHeart, but out in Los Angeles, so I never see him. I don't know him, and he just happened to find my podcast one day. We've become oh, we're coworkers now. We're friends. Uh, so this is from uh, from Mike. He says, "Fun fact: I was actually at Gilby's first show, December fifth, nineteen ninety one, at the Worcester Centrum." He told me and the oh right on yeah so he said because he worked in radio he told me and the others uh-huh. at the at that lunch because I guess this was with his old boss at Universal Music so for some context uh, during the that first show during a solo slashes you ducked backstage and puked Axel came back saw That's him not true okay so I, I don't know why this guy is telling me a story that didn't happen because he's like Axel came back so yeah. I'm puking and are you okay so that. That did not happen. No, no. Okay. But Axel did visit me uh, during the show, and it was during Slash's solo. It came back to you know every, every all the guys. You know, it was my first show. Going, hey man, are you okay? When they we had a break or a moment like Duff, you know, Duff and I were next to each other. But you know, everybody's going, hey man, are you okay? Everything going well? And when Axel came to check on me, I was eating a pizza, <laughs> literally e- eating a pizza. And he's going, hey, man, are you okay? Everything all right? I go, I go, yeah. I go, I'm just hungry. I go, I didn't realize how long the show was. <laughs> that's really, that's a better story. <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. I mean, I've told it before, you know. It, it, okay. It, yeah, I'm, anybody knows me, I don't puke before or after shows. I'm not a nervous person. Okay, because, again, I was surprised. And 
Uh, I, I guess I would rather ask, you know. You I'm think... not saying somebody wasn't puking. It just wasn't me. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. We'll leave it at, at that. Uh, this is from B. Garba uh, on, on Twitter. Ask him why he always uh, played wild horses and Axel presenting him as the man with the new Corvette. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, so that's kind of interesting because at the very first show, uh, I didn't expect to have a, a solo spot. Like, a, you know, like, hey, ladies and gentlemen, Gilby Clark, you know, where before it was, hey, ladies and gentlemen, Izzy Stradlin. And, uh, you know, Slash is the lead guitar player. I'm not going to sit up there and doodle away when Slash is doodling away. It's just stupid, you know. So they came up to me before the first show. They go, hey, what are you going to do for your solo part? And I was like, solo part? What are you talking about? I'm not going to sit there and do a solo before Slash does one. That, you know, it ain't going to happen. <laughs> And so he goes, well, Izzy used to do, uh, I, I, they, I forgot what they told me. They said Izzy used to do something like a Stones kind of thing. And that's why I went, oh, well, why don't I do Wild Horses? I go, I'll just, just, just leave me by myself and I'll do like a Wild Horses and maybe I'll sing a little or something and I'll make it kind of, you know, kind of cool. Well, when I started doing it, Slash started doodling with me. And what you saw through those years is it developing, but it all developed live. We never sat down and said, hey, it's going to go like this. That literally happened at the first show. That's awesome. Of me playing Wild Horses and Slash walking up behind me doodling. That's and, rock and, and that's roll. what happened. And exactly. I mean, it was very natural. I mean, if anybody really knew the ins and outs of GNR during that time, you know, there wasn't a lot of pre-thought into anything. <laughs> Stuff just happened. <laughs> Fair enough. But uh, yeah. the, the, man with the, the man with the new Corvette thing was funny because, uh, it, and this story is out there too, but the, the truth is uh, – the band, the Tokyo shows, we did three shows and the band made a lot of money in merchandise. So, you know, like after the first or second show it was, you know, Hey man, we made so much money. Oh my God. And then guys are, you know, excited about that. And, and, and I, I was just like, I, I didn't get merchandise. That wasn't part of my deal. And I was like, Oh, well enjoy it. And uh, I, I go, I hope I get a new car out of it or whatever. And Duff ended up buying me uh, a car, actually gave me his Corvette. But it was a, it didn't just give it to me. I traded him a shirt for it. There was, he used to have this black mesh shirt I wore back in the day. And, uh, and Duff used to steal it from me. Like, even before I can go wear it, he was wearing it. <laughs> and, uh, and so we actually traded the shirt for his uh, vet that he had at that time. Wow, that's, a, that's an even trade. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> I thought I got a good deal. <laughs> yeah, a fantasy sports commissioner would not allow that trade. But, yeah, good for you. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> I'm I'm wondering your your thoughts on because you are, you know, you're you're authentic. You are rock and roll, and that's why I, I felt it was so appropriate that your the first single is "Rock and Roll" is getting louder. If you could speak to your thoughts on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, not just your experience when you went, but I mean, I don't know why, but for me personally, it just bothered me so much more this year that like Motorhead didn't get in, and Soundgarden didn't get in. Should we care about the Hall of Fame as much? Like, what, I guess, what do you think of it? I don't want to put words in your mouth. Uh, I'll tell you exactly how I feel. That no, you shouldn't care about it. You should care about it like you care about going to Denny's. <laughs> I mean, seriously, we're the, there's no validity, and I'm not just saying that because I mean, you can honestly say, did I get burned? Yeah, I got burned, but I didn't. It didn't matter to me at that time. It only. When when it went down, the whole GNR thing, I didn't even know about it until like it was a done deal. Um, Matt had inside information, so he kind of you know got in there and you know got himself included, which obviously included Dizzy too. By the time it got to me, it was a done deal, and I didn't really care. I mean, Sasha and I had a conversation about it. You know, I I, I said, look. It, it, when you think of Guns N' Roses, you think of the five guys, and, and, and so do I. Mm. You know, that's what it, it should be. But if you're going to induct Dizzy and Matt, I mean, now I feel left out. Mm. I mean, yes, Matt and Dizzy made the Illusion Records. That's absolutely true. And I, I would never take credit where credit wasn't due. But who fucking cares who gets <laughs> in? It's not like anybody gets a dollar for it or whatever. Right. I mean, my honest take on it is, you're inducting Guns N' Roses as Guns N' Roses. Put all the guys that were in the band at that time, you know, you know, you know Bumblefoot and, uh, you know, every, Richard, everybody. Mm -hmm. Who cares? It's not, like, it's not like we get money for it. But if you're going to have a, a ceremony, yeah, you know, maybe have, you know, Slash Duff and, uh, you know, and, and a couple of the guys speak. But 
who cares? Because the thing is, they've pretty much proven that they've gotten it wrong every time. I mean, they, I, I didn't feel so bad. I mean, like I said, I felt bad in the beginning when I found out Matt and Dizzy got inducted and I did. And I was like, oh, man, you know, it sucks to be left out. Hmm. But then I heard the Chili Peppers got inducted the same thing, but they didn't in, induct Dave Navarro. Right. Dave Navarro played on some million-selling records, you know, and then I kind of went to the hot and I found out something. Right. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of weird things. And then, you know, they inducted the Grateful Dead and inducted like 100 people. So, I mean, like when those things happen, then it puts it in perspective. I don't really give a flying fuck. You know, it mm-hmm. it's not like I get anything for being in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You know, it's not like suddenly, you know, 100 more people are going to come to the show. You know, it literally is a line somebody will say when they, you know, I go do a TV show, Gilby Clark, you know, rock and roll hunt, you know, it, 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 and I don't think there's any real validity in it. There, I think some people hold it in high regard, but it literally is a select group of people making these decisions. And I don't know how qualified they are. I don't know if any of them have ever been in a van, you know, if any of them ever, you know, gotten paid to play a musical note, you know? So I, I, I don't, uh, at like least I'm, it's not a big deal to me, and it shouldn't be to everybody else. Well, I really appreciate your your gospel truth about about that, you know, <laughs> your your honesty <laughs> about it. So, um, I, I've, again, I've taken up so much of your time, and I'm sure you're itching to get back on the bike. Uh, this is just a nice transition question to you know to kind of wrap up here. This is from a hefty lefty, ten o one on Twitter. I love Gilby, one of Cleveland's favorite sons. Gilb, because I guess he knows you, uh, time to get back to Ohio for some shows. So with that, I know the record, it's going to be this year. We don't know uh, as soon as the word. (laughs) Uh, But what about shows? When can we, because I know you are out and about. What's your your touring schedule like? Yeah, I do do selected shows every now and then, but I don't really tour. You know, kind of what happens is, like I said, I get offered a show, you know, whether it's a, you know, a, a motorcycle event and then you go, oh, well, we're going to be in Texas. Let's book two or three shows around it. That literally is how it goes down. Okay. So, you know, something has to, you know, I'm not going to go out and tour and, you know, pound my head in the clubs and stuff like that. You know, it just times have changed. You know, I'm I'm not 35 anymore. You know, it's a little harder. Uh, so there will be some shows, you know, uh, I kind of want to gauge, you know, how the record does, you know, you know, is it going to bring some people to the table, you know, cause it's a different world out there, you know, I mean, there's so much self promotion now and I, and my honest answer is I'm not good at it. I'm really <laughs> not good about, you know, yeah. Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. I'm just not good. It's just, you know, it's, I, I would rather have the people that are good at it, do it. You know, let me just play guitar. <laughs> Right, right, yeah, no, right on. Honestly, if it wasn't for radio, I think I would be done with it, you know. And but yeah, in in your business and in my business, we we got to do it. But you know, if I had the balance, I would be like you and just block out all the noise and and just go for a ride. And, and oh, by the way, this yeah. just this just came in. Uh, Alex Grassi says uh, says hello. Oh, Alex! Alex is the man. Yeah, he's been on. And of uh, of course, Alex and Dizzy Reed, Hookers and Blow, they are also label mates of yours. On, on Golden Robot Records. So, Gilby, I can't thank you enough for your time and answering not, not just my questions, uh, listener questions, because you, you know, it may have been kind of just a part of, it's part of your career, uh, but I really don't believe that the GNR thing defines you with with your fans. You know, it, it's it sucks when, you know, people use clickbait and they say, you know, it's always attached to your name, but you've done so much in your career the, that's more than just GNR, and you're you're a Hall of Famer to me, if that means anything. Oh, well, thank you, Brando. I mean, it, that does mean something to me. I mean, it's like I said, it, it's it can be re- really fun out there when you're performing shows and you get accolades, you know, from your audience and stuff. Um, we all have our reasons why we're doing it and stuff, and, and, and I agree. You know, GNR is a part of my history. That's why I don't mind answering questions about it. You know, what I do mind is answering the same questions over and over again. You know, it's kind of, uh, once again, I keep bringing it back to slash, but slash wrote the book cause he was tired of answering the same questions. Yeah. That's where you, you get the resistance, you know, and stuff. It's like, you know, these answers are out there, you know, it, it usually only takes two or three clicks if it's important to you. No, you're right. So, and, and I'll just say it to you rather than, than ask it. Yeah. You know, and cause it goes along with the hall of fame thing. 
that I embrace the whole – because I'll use the comparison. I don't know if you're a sports guy, but to sports. I am a sports guy. Okay, yeah. so who's your like your favorite baseball team? Uh, well, I've been a boy. It's so hard. I'm from Cleveland, so you know I'm an Indians and a, now I'm a Dodgers guy. Indians and Dodgers. Okay, fair. Well, like, yeah, sure. Like the Dodgers. So I feel like if if you're a Dodgers fan, you don't just root for who the roster is today. You are you're rooting yeah. for the their entire history. Kirk Gibson. You're rooting for everybody, and that's how I feel about my favorite band. So with Guns N' Roses, I'm rooting for everybody, from Rob Gardner, the first uh, drummer, to you know, to Brain, to Gilby Buckethead, Slash, obviously. So everybody, you know, because I just like this brand that has created this music. So that's that's how I look at it. So with that being said, you know, I, I hope one day you do, you know, uh, do something again. You join them on stage for something. So I, I just hope it happens because you are a, a special part of their history, uh, especially growing up watching those DVDs, the, uh, the what was it, Tokyo shows. You know, so that was for someone who's 36 who didn't get to see the original GNR. I only got to see Axel and Slash finally on stage with this current reunion. So for a long time, those DVDs were my only way of of seeing Guns N' Roses. So to me and a lot of other fans, you are as much part of their history as as important as as anything else. So, again, that's more of just a statement to you because I know you've you've been asked, (laughs) you know, things of that that, that nature. So. Uh, Gilby, thank you so much. Obviously, uh, I'm going to be on it as soon as the the album uh, comes out. Uh, or I, I guess what we're expecting a couple singles first. So uh, you'll, you'll tease yeah. us further, but we've been waiting 15 years. We can wait a few more months, so it's okay. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Thank, thank you, you Brando. Like I said, I appreciate you keeping the spirit alive, man. Wow. Did not expect to get nearly 50 minutes with Gilby Clark. I was appreciative of any of his time because, you know, I... I done shorter interviews and i said you know before we started recording you know if you got to go at a certain time don't worry about it he's like no i'm just you know taking a break from from riding my motorcycle so (laughs) now's a good time so whatever (laughs) and that's how immediately he just kind of you know with some of these interviews i could be a bit apprehensive as far as especially if it's a former gnr guy and they're coming on a GNR themed podcast and and you the AFD show listener you may know what I'm about and I'm not going to pepper them with you know uh, with questions that are going to get them in trouble or to incite something or so they could always be a bit of just feeling out at the beginning of, of an interview even though they agree to it I just there's always a bit like if you don't until you speak on the phone or meet you you just don't know, I guess, until it's, it's it occurs. But right away, as soon as I picked up the phone, you know, again pre pre interview, just super nice. He made me feel relaxed. Usually, my job as the uh, the interviewer is to make the guest feel relaxed. But uh, right away, he was just cool as shit. So we're going to wrap this episode up with a segment that I I have yet to name it, and I'm not talking about. And I and we'll get to this. When I put out there, I want a a segment names for when we have newer bands on that somehow tie to Guns N' Roses, of course. You know, what are we going to call it? Just like when we had uh, Corey Marks from Canada. And we're also uh, upcoming. We're going to hear from another Canadian band. They were there the same day as as Corey. A bleaker, like an alt-rock pop band from from Canada. So that's going to be a... And since I already recorded it, I... Don't have a name for that specific segment yet, the new band segment yet. Uh, But that's going to be attached to a Tom Kiefer interview. Yes, so you have that to look forward to. So Tom Kiefer recorded. Both both of those are in the can, as they say. So be on the lookout for those interviews. So anyway, uh, I have yet to name this segment, uh, the male segments. I kind of just lazily just just said the last time I read your comments, whether it be on Facebook or Twitter or you know, wh- wherever you can reach me, if it's a comment, a suggestion, whatever I want to include in this mail segment. And I was like, what do I want to call it? I just said, oh, we just call it mail. That's what I think I just said last time, which is so stupid. But for whatever reason, I'm just driving and it just hit me. It, 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 that's how you know when it's the name is right. So this is a segment we like to call 
Mr. Mailstone. Here's the mail, it never fails. It makes me want to wag my tail. When it comes, I want to well. <laughs> the milestone all right so uh, amongst the places that you can reach me of course on facebook facebook facebook.com slash the afd show and on facebook you can recommend me so anyone who comes across my page on the good old fb they can see what you are saying about me so this is from uh, geraldine delord uh the place to be if you like gnr thanks to brando for his kindness and respect to both his guests and fans. Wow, that's very nice. I try to be, uh, just have a lot of respect. You know, show me your respect, I show you respect. That's how it works. And, you know, you as, as fans have just been absolutely great. I really don't have to really police any fights on social media. And obviously, I want to be polite to my guests and respect them because otherwise they won't come back. And I won't get any more guests. And then the show is over. (laughs) Uh, So this is uh, another recommendation. And you may recognize some of these names that I've repeated over the course of some episodes, which I like. For whatever radio show you listen to, you get a lot of of, like the same callers. Especially if it's um, sports radio or political radio, you have the same people who call in and and again and, and contribute. So I appreciate everybody who contributes. So this is from Garrett Smith from Texas. Bad Apple. Bad Apple. That's right. So I can't remember the last time I checked my GNR forum or news articles about GNR because this has become my GNR, my go-to source for all things interesting or pertaining, pertaining to Guns N' Roses and other favorite bands and topics. Well, I, I do appreciate that, Garrett. And he is one of the many listeners who submit great questions. And you... You all really helped me with this Gilby interview, and I, I love when I'm able to just, I mean, yeah, it makes my life easier, <laughs> I guess, uh, but that's not the point of it. I'm being a bit silly there, because I just have a very smart, we have a, we have a very smart audience here. I can't tell you the amount of times I see a, a question submitted from you, the listener, that I never would have thought of. I'm like, wow, that's a good one. So you help make these interviews better. Absolutely. Uh, but I will say, I still go on my GNR forum all the time. That's how I keep up to date. There are some, you know, I know you got to sift through a lot of maybe uh, fighting and arguments about things, but there's uh, it's pretty good as far as being just being updated with information and you make your own opinion. Uh, so this was, again, I'm going to get all these comments from wherever you could talk to me on social media because I am on my GNR forum. You can find me on the, under the username Gambit83 on my GNRforum.com. Gambit, my, at least when I was younger, my favorite X-Men. I know his, his power wasn't that great. He threw cards that exploded. But he, just, he looked cool. He looked like a rock star, essentially. Plus, he in that X-Men cartoon, Rogue was hot, if I can say that. So, if you can get Rogue. Anyway, I'm going to a weird place. This is... uh. This was a comment left when I posted the Vicki Hamilton interview. So this is from War41. Haven't commented on your interviews lately, Gambit83, but I've been listening all along. I think Vicky speaks a lot of the fans' attitudes toward this summer's tour. I am uh, paraphrasing, but she said, I saw the reunion tour twice already, but I'm not going to go again. I think this is exactly how fans feel. She's not saying it's a bad thing that they're touring, but... That isn't worth her attending again. And he continues to say, we need new music. We need a drastically different set list. We need an Axel interview. There has to be something to get excited about, uh, to give casual fans, uh, and frankly, a good amount of hardcore fans likely a reason to go. Well, there's a lot to unpack there. And, you know, frankly, that's a conversation that happens a lot on my GNRforum.com and We've also discussed that at length on the podcast as well. You know, and I already got my tickets for this summer, and I'm excited. I got them before they announced Smashing Pumpkins. That's just, you know, that that made me, like, it's even happier that I got tickets to see them. But regardless, like I said, I bought tickets before. And, you know, I think what it comes down to for me, and maybe a lot of fans, and you can certainly comment just like War41 did in my GNR forum or however you want to comment. I can read it on a 
uh, on a future Mr. Mailstone, your your response. But I thought about it actually driving to the, the New York City today, driving to work, driving right here in the studio. And, you know, I have on my playlist, I have every Guns N' Roses song that is uh, legally uh, available to stream, you know, through the like Spotify or iHeartRadio. Everything, even the stuff that was on the box set, those new work tunes, the, the things that are just short instrumentals that could be throwaways. I have everything, but I don't just listen to straight GNR, as I'm sure many of you uh, don't as well. It's in a mix of just all my favorite stuff, you know, in a mix of like 4,000 songs, I think, right now, my playlist yeah, is, is that. And you know what? When, when Guns N' Roses comes on, I got to so- sing along. I do. And for. For so long, yeah, the Guns N' Roses shows with Bucket and Bumble and, you know, Robin Fink, they were all amazing. I love that period of the band, and I, I would love to see kind of future collaborations. You never, you know how bands work. You never know what can happen in the future. I mean, other bands, not Guns N' Roses. <laughs> uh, but for Axel and Slash to be on stage together again, I think it's just, it's just still a, a big deal. And for someone like me who gets a chance to, to very poorly sing along to the, the music at, you know, at a concert with thousands of other fans is something that I want to experience, even if it is the same set list, which it's, it hasn't been. There's certainly a nice uh, outline to it, you know, kind of like maybe the, the core songs, how it kicks off, but they've been throwing in other stuff from the illusions. And, you know, again, it, it's, it's not drastic, you know. I I, I I I hate bringing this up, but it's I, I've gotten to learn a lot about Dave Matthews over the past couple of years while dating my girlfriend, and just how often I know they're a different kind of band, but you know, GNR has, you know, they may not have a gigantic catalog, but they certainly have enough of a catalog and to keep it fresh. And so we'll see what this year brings. I believe they're going to announce more headliners, but. Um, I think Vicky does speak for some fans. I don't think she certainly speaks for all of them because she did say that she would see them twice already. And I think probably because she still cares about uh, Izzy and Steven, that's what she really wants to see. She got the idea, you know, of what not in this lifetime, this version of GNR is, you know, to go twice. Uh, she could have been like, ah, just once and that's it. Like Gilby Clark just heard Chinese democracy once and that was it, you know, so she went twice. So, uh, again, it's, I will say at the beginning of this reunion stuff, it was like, when is it going to end? When an act, when are Axel and Slash going to start fighting again and this whole thing going to blow up? So at the beginning, it was like, I got to see this before I will never have an, another chance. I think at this point in time, it feels like they're going to a t- uh, the tour for a very long time. That's how it feels until Axel doesn't want to do it anymore. Which is great, but that sense of urgency to get tickets may not be there. So that may ch- that has changed. But uh, I'm certainly not, I'm I'm never going to count this band out. You know, with with doing something creative and and interesting. So we'll see where it goes. Next up, I, I got more suggestions on what to name the the new band uh, the new band segment going forward. So we finally named this Mr. Mailstone. We got that in the bag. We got Fan Obsession. We got PTIRS. Uh, what else do we got? Do we have any other segments? Oh, I got, sorry. Sorry for Russ. When our buddy, uh, Russ TCB comes on from my GNR forum. I'm sorry for Russ. I'm sorry for me. Something is wrong with me. Get that guy out of here. That guy right there. That's <laughs> sometimes. I got to calm down. So the new band segment, this is from uh, Mackin26, another uh, great contributor to the show with all his questions. Appetite for Discovery. Wow, that's pretty good. It's close to yours and an album that no one has heard of. Okay. Uh, Plus, I remember being in my late teens and having a huge appetite for new music, uh, discovering with uh, Metallica, Nine, The Doors, Aerosmith, The Stones, Pink, Floyd, etc. Same thing here. Hmm. So, you know, Appetite for Discovery is up there as far as the names I'm considering. Uh, maybe it could be uh, Anything New Goes. 
or Appetite for Discovery. Honestly, I think those are the two front runners for now. So I'll keep you posted. I know you're excited. Uh, and another suggestion for the new music segment, uh, G and Orant. <laughs> That's great. That is submitted by Bucket O Trouble on Twitter. And no, it is not a Buckethead cover band. It is an Izzy cover band. I believe an acoustic uh, duo cover band, I believe. So you should check them out on Twitter. So GNR, no, GNR, and <laughs> I like that. And we'll wrap up here. This was a message sent to me on Facebook. Uh, Robert Jimenez. Hey, what's up, Brando? Hope all is well with you. Anyways, because <laughs> I can re- respond to like, Just so you know, uh, still listening to the show. It's getting better and better. I like the fact that I started from the first episode, which I'm on now, which is why I wanted to ask, episode 50 isn't on Spotify. It skips from 49 to 51, and uh, episode 50 was the Eric Gardner episode that Raz Q set up. So I just wanted to find out where I can hear that episode at. Currently on 52 with Squires, love it, bro. Shit is amazing. Gets my work shift to move a lot faster. Much love from... And forgive me if I can't pronounce this. I always have I have a pronouncing issue. Good thing I'm in radio. Uh, Muretta, California. You know, I've said on the show I've never been out there. I could pronounce Los Angeles, but Muretta. I uh, hope so. M U R R I E T A. Well, Robert, that was all awesome. I really appreciate the, the great feedback. And and yeah, us. Uh, let's just say to simplify it, some episodes are. Hidden tracks. I don't know. The inter- the internet is a jungle. And sometimes you, you had to take certain steps to protect your your portion of the jungle. I don't know where I was really going with this. So uh, I, with Robert, I actually just sent him a link. So if you have any issues finding any episodes, I got them all. Just DM me, direct message, private message, whatever the kids are saying now, and I'll send it to you. Simple as that. So anyway, that wraps up this episode of Appetite for Distortion. Gilby fucking Clark. Yes, look at that. (laughs) You were waiting for me to get super excited and just pump that out. You know, it's been a great ride on this podcast night train. And to get people like Gilby Clark and Robin, uh, Richard Fortas rather, and Tommy Stinson and Brain and Vicki Hamilton and Rob Gardner and Al Niven and Doug Goldstein. It's just been really, really cool to get these uh, these people that are, were there. You know, I love talking to and will continue to love talking to those fringe people like Ron Young. I love that we're the fact that we're talking about Little Caesar so much and finding out more about the uh, the Snake Pit auditions. But as we know, these GNR guys can be. Uh, Elusive, and, and that, I think believe that's po- probably part of what makes us love them so much because, you know, they're, they're like a mystery. It's not just the music, but it's like a mystery we have to to solve in a way, a puzzle we have to put together. And the fact that we're getting pieces of this, you know, metaphoric puzzle, and you and I, I I'm reading the, the comments from you, and I'm reading the questions from you that you submit, and you're you're co-hosting because of you. We're putting this Guns N' Roses puzzle together, and we're having a lot of fun doing it. Just trying to put this this monstrosity <laughs> together. So thanks again, whether you found us on iHeartRadio, a Spreaker, Stitcher, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, however you listen to podcasts, just thanks for hanging out. Leave a review, a comment, participate in the in the show. That's what I want going forward. This isn't just it's about Guns N' Roses, but it's it's the Guns N' Roses community, and I'm just you know the conductor of the the night train, so to speak. So what is to come? Don't forget and always remember that the best way to follow and participate in the upcoming guests and announcements and all that fun stuff is to follow on social media, at the AFD Show on Twitter, Appetite for Distortion on Instagram, facebook.com slash the AFD Show. Tell a friend and let them know about this podcast. That's how we keep getting bigger and bigger and better and better guests, okay? So until next time, we're going to chat on social media between episodes, but as far as when are you going to hear the next interview, the next episode? To the lame-ass security, I'm going home.